I wanted to have you on the show for a number of reasons to talk about creating meaningful goals or a meaningful life, uh, coaching and also public speaking. But before we mm. dive into those subjects, let's touch on how you became known as the bucket list guy. And as the bucket list guy, what do you do? Yeah, it's a good point. I'm still trying <laughs> to figure it out. Um, <laughs> no, no, I uh, became the bucket list guy. Someone actually called me the bucket list guy about 12, I think it's now 13 years ago. So um, prior to that, you know, I'm obviously yeah, getting a little bit grayer. <laughs> um, out at, so I'm in Ocean Grove now, about an hour and a half out of Melbourne. Grew up surfing, still surf, surfing, surf life saving, swimming competitively. So I was always kind of a jock. And that led me to do a physical education degree at university. So off I went, moved to Footscray from Ocean Grove. That was a bit of a culture shock and started my phys ed degree there about, and I had no idea what I was going to do. thought I was going to be, you know, a high school PE teacher or something like that. And then this guy came in, Tony Hewitt, he was doing this thing in the, you know, earlier nineties, mid nineties called personal training. And he was getting paid a whole two hundred dollars an hour, like in the mid nineties. Wow! And here I was, f- basically as a kid swimming teacher for beer money, getting whatever per hour, <laughs> um, you know, uni beer money. And I was just fascinated with what he, he trained some celebrities. He trains, you know, wealthy people and. He was getting results. More importantly, he'd really coach them to get results, you know, way more results than the average gym. I was just fascinated. And so he said, this is before the internet, before Facebook and Instacrack and you know, all the rest of it. He's like, subscribe to this magazine, you know, go to this conference, you know, get this book, et cetera. I just did everything. He said, I was fascinated. So I followed him around. And I uh, did everything he said and got my first personal training client in the mid nineties. And, you know, as a coach, as you know, mate, you, you get one client and just look after them really, really well. It's not hard to grow a coaching practice, let alone a personal training business. So she, Heather, my first client referred, every, got some great results for us. She, it's a whole other story. She referred everyone in the English speaking language and then some to my business. I think my record was 63 one hour mobile personal training sessions in a week. And I did that wow. for like three years. So I was running around doing everything with them, fit as, didn't invest my money very well, but then started to bring on other trainers. I know there's a really long answer. Um, other <laughs> trainers got one of the first personal training studios in Melbourne and had, what, 13 personal trainers working in our Richmond studio. One of the trainers said, I wouldn't mind doing one of these studios. And I investigated what franchising looked like. And uh, I was the first to franchise personal training studios in Australia. Jai started our Canterbury personal training studio. And as a result, we built up a chain of, uh, I think, 21, 22 personal training studios around Australia and three states. I had a, a truckload of personal trainers working under that umbrella. Then we we're just having a conversation earlier. Let in some toxic people into the system um, who thought they could do it better than me. Quickly became a tail wagging the dog kind of situation. They rallied everyone against me. Some other stuff going on in my life. It was like a perfect storm for me slipping into depression, albeit mild. I'm getting to the answer. <laughs> um. The doctors wanted to put me on heavy antidepressants and I trained too many clients that were on antidepressants that were just kind of sleepwalking through their life. I said, no, I don't want to put a Band-Aid over the top of it. I wanted to get to the root cause of what I was going through. And I went to every course God, I did, you know, went to Burning Man, went, did ayahuasca, did, you know, did Tony Robbins walked on fire. I've read every <laughs> book. It was actually funnily enough, Nick, too. I worked out my values, you know, did all the life coaching courses. And it was around that time that I, I actually came across Hickey Guy as well, oh. you know, around that time. And that combined with Tel Ben Shahar's work, which is, a, as you know, a positive psychologist yep. who worked under Martin Seligman the grandfather, if you like, of positive psychology. And he's got this book, Happier, and was gifted to me by a friend of mine who basically said, here's a book on happiness, Trav, you miserable prick. Um, you know, <laughs> come work yourself out because you're real, you're a real pain in the ass to be around. So I did that, and it's got a Venn diagram in that, and it's MPS process. So it's just here, and it's what gives you meaning, what gives you pleasure, and what are your strengths, and in the middle is your calling. I'm doing all this 
you know, going th- working out my stuff. And I did. I got to the root cause of what I was kind of going through, did this MPS process, and I got motivational speaker. You know, I'm an educator by a trade like you. I can't help it. You know, I love mm-hmm. helping people. And I went, oh, God. And around that same time, a friend of mine actually in one of these seminars said, Trav, you're in a lot of these seminars. You're investing a lot of money. Why don't you teach this stuff? And I was like, I don't know, all the worlds came, you know, the planets aligned and, <laughs> and I went, yeah, that's why I'm here. Okay, so I've worked out some of my stuff, but I really want to pay it forward. So I put on a talk and I was absolutely crapping myself, put on a talk about a month later and I learned NLP, learned all the life coaching stuff, all my, my entrepreneurial history. I've really only, only owned my own businesses. I've never had a corporate job in my life. So I put all that into a three-hour seminar. Halfway through the seminar, I only had about 40 people that came to that seminar. I nearly had to pay them to be there. <laughs> and um, <laughs> this is, again, about 13 years ago. But halfway through the seminar, I asked the group, well, I, I sorry, I showed the group that I had since I was 18. I'm 50 now. So since I was 18, I'd had a list to do before I die, actually written down. And I picked it up in a, you know, in a book somewhere. I just always had that that compass, that North Star, that reason for getting out of bed in the morning, that reason to get off the fence and make decisions. It was always like my reason. Well, it wasn't to be a millionaire. It wasn't to, It wasn't about the time or the money. Is what I would do with that time or money because mm-hmm. time and money are just resources. You know, so we build businesses, we have careers, we have jobs, and if you do that well, if they're optimized, it should, they should spit out time flow and cash flow to you for allow you, the owner of that job, career, business, to go and do their the things that they really want to do in life. Because it's not about the time and the money, it's what you do with those resources. So I've always had this philosophy. And sure, build something that you're really proud of, a legacy if you like. And I started telling the group, you know, what some of the things that I've done in my life and you know, some of the stuff that I've written down since I was 18. And uh, I asked the group, who else has got one of these lists actually written down, like out of their head, separated from their to-do list? Mm-hmm. And it was donuts, no one. I'm like, <laughs> why the hell do you get up in the morning? You know, yeah. what? how do you make this stuff? Con- you know, but most people still today, Nick, I ask most people, what are your goals in life? And they'll give me, you know, three answers normally. And that is, especially here in Australia, pay off the house, put the kids through school, do a bit of travel when I'm older Mm. and possibly sicker. I added that bit. They didn't. (laughs) Um, It's like, dude, is that your goal? That's that's it? People don't get to do the travel bit because, you know, what the movie was all about, the bucket list movie was all about, the use-by dates that, you know, people get. So at the end of the seminar, Joe, one of the personal training clients at the time, said, oh, how's this list to do before you die stuff? It's like a bucket list. You're like the bucket list guy. I went, ping, (laughs) light bulb moment, number two, and I went home and registered the bucketlistguy.com and I've been reverse engineering it ever since. Mm. And in that moment, I decided to go online before it was COVID cool. And here I was with all these bricks and mortar commercial leases of gyms all around Australia and, you know, one of the books that I read at that time was Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. So he's, you know, he's me with all this burden and, you know, of, of these gyms and uh, overhead yep. running a big business. And he's Tim Ferriss running everything from a freaking hammock in Thailand. I'm yeah. like, hmm, I like that business model. <laughs> I like fr- the freedom is one of my top values. Yeah. yeah. But like I said, I, I've been doing that ever since. 